Hello everyone, we're going to be returning to the wisdom of James Burnham this week in his book The Machiavellians as we discuss the concept of overproduction of elites and take a look at how it may have accelerated the downfall of the liberal order inside the United States. Now we're going to need to start off with some background, and so the first concept I want to discuss is called the Iron Law of Oligarchy. This is a relatively well-known concept if you've studied political theory. I'm not really pulling from very deep waters here, so if you already know about this, forgive me, but for those who don't, we need to cover this if you're going to understand what we're talking about going forward. In its most basic formulation, the Iron Law of Oligarchy states that no matter what kind of government you say you have, in the end you're always going to end up with an oligarchy. It doesn't matter if you think you have a monarchy or if you think you have a democracy. If you have a functioning country, if you have a functioning state, it's going to end up becoming an oligarchy. And the logic is pretty simple. It always takes a relatively closely held group of elites to actually make a reasonably sized country work. If you're a monarch, if you're a king, you're not just going to run the state entirely by yourself. You're going to need other people who you can rely on, and there are going to be people who even you as a king are actually accountable to. Your nobles, your advisors, it's always going to require a handful of elite people who work with you in order to actually control the country. The same is true for democracies. Even in the type of political systems where we say the power is with the people, the power is spread out among all the citizens, everyone is part of the franchise, even in the those type of systems, at the end of the day, the country cannot actually operate with 100 million or 200 million or 330 million people all actually having continuous input into how the government runs. The people may think that they're giving their consent through a voting process, but at the end of the day, there is a certain class of people who will make it to D.C., who will make it as governors, who will take control of governments, and they will promote their friends from the inside. They will promote their relatives from the inside. They will encourage people they know and people in their circles to continue to take jobs that hold and maintain power. And in the end, they're the ones that actually end up running the country. And so this is how we end up with the iron law of oligarchy. No matter how you actually pretend your country is run, it will always be in the hands of an elite class. This is an unavoidable thing, which is why they call it an iron law, right? It's not really the fault of one type of system of government or another. It's not some kind of fault in the American government that doesn't exist somewhere else. This happens everywhere all the time. It is the iron law of oligarchy. As James Burnham points out in his book, The Machiavellians, due to the reality that all countries are in the end going to be governed by a set of elites and they're going to be defined by those set of elites, what's important is to make sure that you have a high circulation among your elites. You want to make sure that there's an opportunity for up-and-comers to climb. You're going to have smart people, you're going to have talented people, you're going to have ambitious people. And the problem is that if you keep your elites closed, if you keep it completely cut off, then your best and brightest are going to get stuck outside of the elite class. They're going to get stuck outside of the ruling class. And that's a problem on two fronts. One, it creates stagnation. Your elite class becomes calcified. It becomes entrenched. It doesn't get new ideas. It doesn't get fresh blood. It doesn't get access to the best and the brightest. And therefore, the quality of government goes down. The quality of the state goes down. As the best and brightest are wasted, they're suppressed. And people who don't generally deserve it, people who are substandard continue to run the country. The other reason that you want a circulation of elites is, of course, if you continually suppress the best and brightest, if you continuously suppress the talented and the ambitious, what you're eventually going to do is create a disaffected class. A class of people who otherwise would be elites, a class of people who otherwise would be contributing to society. And that set of people is not going to be happy with their station. Eventually, they're going to see past your facade, whatever you're calling your government. They're going to realize the oligarchy. They're going to recognize that there's a rule of elites and that they cannot aspire to actually join those ranks despite their talent, their ability, their ambition, and all these other positive traits they could bring. And that's going to create discontent. It's going to boil up and it's going to create a pressure point. You're going to end up getting a rebellious sector of the population who feels like it's been cut off from power because it doesn't have an opportunity to ascend the ranks. 
Now, there's never a true open circulation of the elite. There's never a point at which anyone can just ascend at will. Even in the most open elite structures, people are still going to come to power. They're still going to get promoted. They're still going to get positions of privilege because of their elite status, because they're the son or daughter of someone who's in the elites. And even people who come from humble beginnings and do climb the ladder usually do so by budding up to current elites. They go to the right school. They make the right connections. They get the right job at the right firm, and once they have entrenched themselves in the proper elite structure, then they are allowed to move up, then they are allowed to send. Once they have bent the knee, kissed the ring, proven that they are part of the right class, that's when they get to rise. That's how they become part of the elites. But even though there's never a completely open structure, you always want to have that ability for elites to circulate, otherwise you foment this rebellion we were talking about. Now, in America and much of the West, we have attempted to tell a story about a meritocracy, how there is no longer a barrier due to birth, who you were born to, what class you were born to. Anyone can ascend. You just have to be smart enough. You just have to work hard enough. This is the story that we've told most of our population when it comes to the circulation of the elites. This is kind of the gospel of liberalism, that all barriers will be removed, all inequalities will be removed, anyone can be part of the process, everyone has a piece of the franchise, their voice will be heard, and they too can become part of this elite class. Because this meritocracy is so ingrained in the American story about who rules and who participates, we've put a lot of faith in the idea of credentialism. College became an essential gatekeeper for the meritocratic process. It became a filtration system by which elites could be siphoned out of the population and integrated into the liberal system along with those who were the descendants of the ruling elite class in order to create a credential that would prove that you should at least be entering into a managerial position or into an elite position as someone who has proven your worth by making your way through the college system. You have met the right people, you've passed the right tests, you've completed the right tasks, you now have the right relationships, and you could be trusted with power. You can be trusted inside the elite structure. While initially these institutions were extremely selective, only letting in people with the right connections and a lot of extra money and time, the doors were opened wide post-World War II, when an entire generation came back from war with GI Bills and began to attend these institutions looking for a better life. Suddenly, college was available to a vast swath of people to whom it had never been a consideration before. In just a few generations, college went from being a privilege of the elite ruling class to something most middle class kids aspired to as part of the baby boom generation. With the flood of new graduates, the college credential started to lose some of its sheen. It no longer signified your place as a small part of an elite ruling class who made it through a very restrictive process and instead became a requirement for an increasingly large number of middle class jobs. Since more and more of the people who would generally have been competing for your average middle class managerial position were now in possession of college degrees, the number of employers requiring college degrees for those positions increased. And now those who'd attended college thinking it was their golden ticket into the fast lane, thinking it was their track to elite status, thinking it was their chance to ascend to the ruling elite, quickly found themselves in a position where they needed that degree just to keep pace with the positions that their fathers and grandfathers had once held. With an increasing number of middle class jobs now requiring a college education, an increasing number of people who never would have made it into college were required to attempt to go in order to compete in the job market. Colleges quickly realized that the vast number of middle class kids who now required their degrees in order to get a decent job were a cash cow, especially since they now had access to basically unlimited federally backed loans that allowed them to attend institutions they otherwise never would have had a chance at going to. And we saw this lead to an incredible rise of tuition costs. All of a sudden, college cost as much as a very nice home. And universities 
days were letting 18 year olds who had never even had a checking account before in their lives sign up for hundreds and thousands of dollars in debt so they could one day work a middle class job in an office cubicle. Of course, those students who were shelling out the hundred thousand dollars in school debt were not told that they were being trained to be a low level manager in an office cubicle. They were being told that they were still going to ascend to elite status. They were still being sold this dream that college will give them access to a whole new world of opportunities. And as these students acquired these gender studies degrees that were never going to make them any money in the real world and were never going to give them any actual power in the real world, they were studying theories about how the United States was terrible and corrupt and being taught that their ancestors were terrible racist slave owners and the entire country was built on lies and blood and they were being told that it was their job as the newly minted elite to go out and fix those problems, to enter the community and make a big impact. And in the end, this is what would give their education and their life purpose. This is what would make them valuable members of the society. That they, with this new knowledge, would enter society as newly minted elites and break down the structures that were holding back the oppressed, holding down the common man, and free everyone from these chains so they could realize the true goal of liberal equality. Of course, when those people eventually emerged with those useless degrees, they didn't end up getting a job at a Fortune 500 company. They didn't end up getting a high-paying job in government. They didn't end up getting a position of power or privilege. They ended up running a shift at Starbucks. They ended up running a cash register at Whole Foods. And suddenly, these young people, millions and millions of them over multiple generations, realized that they were not going to achieve the power and privilege that they had been promised. But of course, they had still been bred to believe that they deserved this elite status. They had the piece of paper. They had the credential. They had done what they were supposed to do. Who should they blame for their lack of power? Who should they blame for their lack of privilege? Who do they blame for the fact that they are stuck with hundreds of thousands thousands of dollars of debt as they make 30 grand a year handing out lattes. They expected to be rulers and now they were stuck with the serfs. What had gone wrong? Well, it turns out they already had a ready-made answer for that. The professors had told them very clearly who was in charge of the country. The professors had told them what was wrong with the country. And if they, someone with an elite degree from a university, was stuck deep down in the dregs of society with the people they hate, the people that they thought they were climbing over on their way to the top, if they were still stuck in the mud with these people, they knew whose fault it was. Our system has produced too many elites, too many people who think they are entitled to rule, who think they are entitled to the power and the privilege, and when they don't get what they think they're entitled to, they do what all elites do when they feel like they're locked out of power. They blame the system and they plan revolution. Mediocre people were promised greatness, and there is nothing that makes someone more spiteful. We overpromised access to our elite class. We trained too many people to do jobs that simply do not exist. And when you combine that dangerous amount of disaffected elites with an education steeped in the ideas of social justice, you have a recipe for disaster. If you like this video, please make sure to click like. If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do that now. Thanks everybody. I'll talk to you next time.